والحمد لله رب العالمين بارئ الخلائق الأجمعين باعث الأنبياء والمرسلين ثم الصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء وسيد المرسلين حبيب إله العالمين المصطفى أبي القاسم محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المنتجبين الذين أذهب الله عنهم الرجس وطهرهم تطهيرا اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد أما بعد فقد قال الله تبارك وتعالى في كتابه المجيد وقرآنه الحميد وقوله الحق أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ويسألونك عن ذي القرنين قل سأثنوا عليكم منه ذكرا إنا مكنا له في الأرض وآتيناه من كل شيء سببا فأتبع سببا حتى إذا بلغ مغرب الشمس وجدها تغرب في عين حمئة ووجد عندها قوما قلنا يا ذا القرنين إما أن تعذب وإما أن تتخذ فيهم حسنا قال أما فنعذبه ثم يرد إلى ربه فيعذبه عذابا نكرا وأما من آمن وعمل صالحا فله جزاء الحسنى وسنقول له من أمرنا يسرا صدق الله العلي Continuing with our discussion about this individual, Abu Qarnayn, we started off by saying that the Jews either directly or indirectly asked the Holy Prophet about this individual, and hence the Prophet is responding to their query. We said that there are three main theories about who this individual was. One suggesting that he was Alexander the Great. Second was that he's one of the king or kings of Yemen. And the third is actually he was Cyrus the Great. And there are some evidence which may suggest that the latter suggestion could be the most valid. Nonetheless, the Prophet responds by saying, I will tell you about him. I'll recite some Qur'an for you about him. So the Qur'an starts off by saying, we allowed him, we enabled him to rule on the earth. We gave him that ability. Plus, we gave him all the necessary tools or means required for him to lead. Not only that, he actually followed those leads. He followed those means. And we invested a lot of time yesterday saying that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who gives the human being every blessing that the human being gets. And a true believer, someone who has a lot of piety, shows his appreciation to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by following every command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He does not leave anything out to the best of his or her ability. They follow the command of Allah. And the Qarnayn did so. Now, today we will move on and continue to talk about the first journey that the Qur'an mentions of this personality. The first journey, apparently, from what the Qur'an describes, was towards the West. So, the Qur'an says, for example, بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم حتى إذا بلغ مغرب الشمس 
وجدها تغرب في عين حمئة ووجد عندها قوما. He started heading west. Apparently he arrived to a place where there was no more land. Now this may be the end of Africa and hence he is kind of standing just before the Atlantic Ocean. Or maybe even further, he may have traveled all the way to Canada let's say and standing at the tip of let's say the Pacific Ocean. Nonetheless, he's traveled somewhere far standing in front of a vast water. And what happens is, you guys are blessed here in Auckland, you get to see the scene quite a lot. When the sun sets, it sets kind of into the water, it's as if it's setting in the water itself. You guys, have you seen this? Yeah. You get much sun anyways, you know, whatever sun you have in Auckland. So you're blessed to see the scene quite regularly, you know. As I say, the romantic scene, you know, where the sun sets just behind the ocean. Okay? Well, many people are not as blessed as you are, they don't have this luxury. So it's something that was very interesting for Dhul Qagnayim. Dhul Qagnayim came and he started seeing the sun setting as if it appears it's setting in the water itself. Which means that basically he reached the tip of some land looking at some vast waters. Nonetheless, sun is setting there. Apparently in that area there were two groups of people. The first group was a religious group, a group of believers. The second group of people, however, they were not. On the contrary, they were corrupt. Now, it's either because their belief was corrupt, in the sense that they did not believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they did not really have some sort of a, a system of faith, or that they may believe in Allah but their actions was exactly the opposite. Like we see many people in this day and age. You might say, I'm a Muslim, you know, they, but once they get to the leadership, then everything is changed. Or their action speaks otherwise. That's why it's important for a Muslim, brothers and sisters, especially for those of us who follow the path of Ahlul Bayt, السلام, that we make sure our ethics, our behavior, our attitude, is in line with the teachings of Ahlul Bayt in line with the teachings of the Quran. Because guess what? When people look at you here, or look at any one of us here, they just don't think of you as Muhammad or Ja'far or Hassan or whomever. They think of you as Islam. You represent Islam here. And that's how we are. Human nature is like this. We are like that too. So if we go, for example, to any Muslim country, and let's say for the first time, in your life, you happen to meet a Japanese man, for example. Whatever impression you get on this Japanese man, you will kind of subconsciously associate it with the entire country. Or for the first time you meet, let's say, a Chinese man, for example. You've never met one before. That first impression you get on that individual, you reflected on the entire one billion nation of that country. You say, all those people are like that. That's how we are as human beings. We're like that. But it's important to realize that people think of us also similarly. So if they see me being Muhammad or Ja'far or Hassan or Ali or so on, and my action is contradictory to these teachings, they say, look at those Muslims. No wonder whatever we hear about them in the news is right. Imam al-Sadiq says to one of his servants or students, he says, الحسن من الكل حسن ومنك أحسن لأنك منا. He says, doing good is good from everybody, but when you do good, it's the best. Why? Because people will look at you and say, he is the student of Jafar ibn Muhammad, الصادق عليه السلام. والقبيح من الكل قبيح ومنك أقبح لأنك منا. And doing bad things is bad from everyone. Anyone who does anything bad is bad. But when you do it, it's even worse. Why? Because again, you're my student. People will look at you and say, this is the student of Ja'far ibn Muhammad, look at him. Look what the teacher is teaching his students. Similarly, it's very important to have this akhlaq, this manner of ethics. Nonetheless, going back to the point, the story, 
The Kalein came across a group that was mu'min believers or a group that was corrupt, whether because their faith was corrupt, in other words, they didn't have any faith in Allah, or whether that they were believers or so-called believers, but their actions were contradictory to their beliefs. So then, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the Qarnayn, what do you want to do with them? Now, apparently, how did Allah tell the Qarnayn this? How did he figure it out? Well, there are two ways. Either, apparently, he was not a prophet of Allah. Dhul-Qaynayn was not a prophet. So there may have been a prophet with dhul who received this revelation and spoke to dhul Just like we mentioned a few days ago about Talut. Talut had a prophet with him who would communicate. Or through inspiration. Like the inspiration Allah gives to Umm Musa, the mother of Musa alayhi salam. وَأَوْحَيْنَا إِلَىٰ أُمِّ مُوسَىٰ We revealed to the mother of Musa. So it could be similarly, that kind of similar inspiration. That Dhul-Qarnayn, now that you have this ability, you have the soldiers, you have the might, you have the power to overcome these individuals, what would you like to do with them? What are you going to do? And Dhul-Qarnayn responds. He says, those who are tyrants, oppressors, we will punish them. We're going to punish them. And then, does it end in here? No, it doesn't. They will return back to Allah, who will punish them a severe punishment. We'll talk about that, inshallah. Then, as for the other group, the believers, we will treat them with virtue and kindness. We'll be kind to them as well. And in fact, we'll make it easy for them. In other words, I won't burden them with taxes, I won't burden them with a lot of pressures and duties. These are the believers, so I'm going to take it easy on them. This now brings us to an important question. The human being has a physical dimension, but he also has a spiritual dimension. A lot of the world today caters to the physical aspects of the human being. They don't cater to the spiritual side. In fact, there is a vacuum, we may say, on the spiritual aspects in this day and age. Dhul-Qarnayn looks at those people and they say, those who are tyrants, oppressors, we're going to punish them. We have two kinds of oppressors. We have those who oppress others, and then we have those who oppress themselves. Well, oppressing others is easy. You know, we see them all around. Many dictators come and go. And in fact, it may not even need to be dictators. You could have an individual in the house, a father or a mother, who oppresses others. You might have a brother oppressing his own brother by taking his right away from him, for example, or the inheritance away from him. We've seen this happen. That's kind of oppression. And such oppression sometimes could be also subtle. A person could do backbiting, ghiba, from another mu'min. That's also a kind of oppression. And such kind of oppression First of all, a person must do istighfar, ask Allah for forgiveness, but at the same time, he must go to the other party whom he is oppressed and ask them to forgive him as well. Then there is also self-oppression. What is self-oppression? If we read the Charter of Rights established by an Imam al-Sajjad, sallallahu alayhi that is something very interesting. I don't know about here, New Zealand, but the Charter of Rights in Canada was written in 1982. 1982. A lot of people were born in that time. In the recent history, that's when the Charter of Rights, the Canadian Charter of Rights was drafted and signed by the Queen in 1982. 
Imam al-Sajjad established a charter of rights that's known as Risalat al-Huquq almost 1400 years ago. And that is something we need to bring out to the people. Unfortunately, we as Muslims, especially the followers of Ahlul Bayt have not done a good job in bringing this information out to the people. That you guys accuse us, for example, that our religion oppresses our religion, doesn't give rights to people, guess what? We have one of the earliest charter of rights drafted. And if you look at it, it's so concise. He starts off by the rights, for example, that we have towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then he talks about the right of your eyes, that you should not look at the haram with your eyes. The right of your ears over you, that you should not be listening to the haram. And that's quite interesting. The rights of your hands, organs, they have rights over you. If you abuse them, then they will testify against you on the day of judgment. يَوْمَ نَخْتِمُ عَلَىٰ أَفْوَاهِهِمْ وَتُكَلِّمُنَا أَيْدِيهِمْ وَتَشْهَدُ أَرْجُلُهُمْ بِمَا كَانُوا يَكْسِبُونَ on the day of judgment, guess what? The mouths will be sealed, zipped. You can't talk. I don't know if you have this expression sometimes when you talk to your children, you tell them, zip it. You know? <laughs> On that day, it will actually happen. The mouth will be zipped. You can't talk. Who will do the talking? The hands. The feet. Ya Allah, this person, for example, did not pay the khums with this hand. Ya Allah, this person stole with this hand. Ya Allah, the ears will start talking. This person listened to the music with me. I didn't want to do that, but he forced me. He looked at the haram, and these days, a lot of our youths, unfortunately, I mentioned it a few days ago, Salat al Jumu'ah, 20 years ago, or maybe even more, when your children were at home, you'd be like, Alhamdulillah, you know, my kids are home, they're safe. Nowadays, with these little gadgets in their hands, even if they're sitting in their bedrooms, you don't know if they're safe. We've had several cases in Canada, most recently a few months ago, where a person commits suicide. And the whole reason is because some predator online managed to get to this individual and convince her of committing suicide online while she's sitting at home. And this happened more than once in Canada. I don't know about here, but in Canada it happens. A few years ago, a 12-year-old boy, 12-year-old, he's found missing from home, he's disappeared. They catch him at the airport. He was about to catch a flight to go to New York from Canada. Because of another predator who somehow found this guy online and fooled him and convinced him to come over to New York. It's a reality, these things are happening. Now unfortunately, a lot of our youths are looking at these things. Or even worse, looking at the haram things. With these gadgets. So we really have to educate ourselves and our children about how to use these tools. I'm not saying ban them, you can't. This is the age of technology. But we have to educate them as to how to use them. So these things are important. They have rights over you. And then Imam continues, the right of your neighbor, the right of, for example, your father over you, the right of the son over his father, etc., etc., etc. So when a person disobeys the commands of Allah, this individual oppresses himself. He oppresses himself. This is where the Qaynayn is saying, those individuals who are oppressors, we need to punish them. Because they are changing the equilibrium of the society. As I mentioned, the human being has these two aspects, the physical aspect and the spiritual aspect. But today's world looks mostly at the physical aspect, and they've left the spiritual aspect. That's why in many cases you find individuals who are not believers, they don't have religion in their lives, they're more prone to suicide. 
people who may be very successful in the materialistic sense. How many actors and actresses have we seen in the past few years who committed suicide? One famous one, if you remember, the Joker of Batman. Remember? Not too long ago. That actor committed suicide, was found dead with an overdose. And many others. How many have we seen in rehab, entering rehab, because of drug abuse or alcohol abuse? Why? You start to wonder, how come? There is something missing. They have the money. They have the fame. They have the authority in some cases. But there is something missing. And it is Allah, God, that spiritual aspect. It's not being catered to. That's why there is actually research to suggest that those individuals who are religious, they are happier. There is research about this. In fact, I remember a few years ago, a study was conducted at the University of California in Los Angeles, UCLA. And they surveyed the students. They found the students who are religious are less prone to suffer from alcohol addiction and from depression compared to those who are not religious. And the study suggests that the reason is because those who are religious, they have this connection with God, which gives them hope. Anytime they feel that, you know, they're, they're feeling down a little bit, they connect with God and they feel hope, they feel relief. And if you think about it, how many times have we, when we feel down, we turn to the du'as of Ahlul Bayt. We turn to the prayers. And you pray to Allah. And you feel this sigh, this relief, as you communicate to Allah. You find people crying sometimes. Some people tell me sometimes, you know, when I feel down, you know, I, I just need to vent. What du'a do you recommend? I said, there are plenty of them. But why don't you try munajatul ta'ibin? Imam al-Sajjad alayhi salam Try it. Why don't you try Dua Abu Hamza al-Thumani? Where he comes and says, Abki wa ma li la abki. Abki li ghulmati qabri. Abki li khuruji nafsi. Abki li ghulmati qabri. Abki li dhiqi lahdi. Abki li suali munkari wa nakirin hiyai. أبكي لخروجي من قبري عريانا ذليلا حاملا ثقلي على ظهري أنظر مرة عن يميني وأخرى عن شمالي إذ الخلائق في شأن غير شأني لكل امرئ منهم يومئذ شأن يغنيه وجوه يومئذ مسفرة ضاحكة مستبشرة ووجوه يومئذ عليها خبرة ترهقها قترة وذلة O oh Lord I cry and why shall I not cry I cry for the time when my soul leaves my body difficult time I cry for the time when I am laid in my grave I cry for how small and tight that space is I cry from the darkness of the grave. I cry from the questioning of Munkar and Nakir, those two angels who will come and will question each and every one of us. Fulan, so and so, tell us, why didn't you pray your Salat in time? Why did you perform the Haram? Answer me. They will ask, why didn't you wear your hijab? Tell us, give us the reasons. How come? What's your excuse today? But there is no excuse. At that <coughs> stage, there is no excuse. And what will the human being say at that point? <laughs> My Lord, send me back. <laughs> 
Maybe I will go back and do the good deeds. I've learned my lesson. Ya Allah, I've learned my lesson. I'll go back, I'll pay the homes, the hukuk, that I never paid them, the 20% tax, which we have had to pay on the excess of our income every year. I'll pay it, Ya Allah, I'll pay it. I'll wear the hijab, now I've seen it. فَكَشَفْنَا عَنْكَ غِطَاءَكَ فَبَصَرُكَ الْيَوْمَ حديد. Now you see the truth, you see the reality. I see it now, Ya Allah. Send me back. I've learned. But what will the response be? Kalla. Too late. Too late. We've given you a lot of chance. <coughs> Sulaiman, the prophet, is here upon him. Sulaiman had a kingdom like no other prophet did. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enabled him to control the jinn, the ants, and the animals. It is said his throne, his throne, it did not have steps. Rather, there were lions sitting down with their paws. So whenever he wanted to climb up the stairs, they would lower their paws, and he would step on the lion's paws. And once he gets over the step, the lion would remove its paws. And he would sit on the throne, and there were two peacocks on the side of the throne. The minute he sat, the peacocks would open their feathers. This was the kingdom of Sulaiman, alayhi salam. Something that you know you could read, be reading about in the fairy tales. But it's the truth. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and maybe Allah did this to show us that when the Imam Ajallah ta'ala Fajr al-Sharif reappears, this kingdom is possible. There will be a cohesion between the jinn and the ants and the animals. It's been done in the past, so why can't it happen again? Possibly. Nonetheless, Sulaiman, despite his might, one day. He tells the jinn to build him a specific tower from which he, he could oversee the entire kingdom. So they do so. He goes into the tower and he says, I don't want anyone to enter. Don't disturb. So he goes in. He's leaning over his stick and he's overseeing the whole kingdom. And then someone walks in. He looks at him and he says, how did you get in? I gave strict instructions that nobody's allowed to come in. He said, not me, Ya Sulaiman. I don't listen to instructions from you. My instructions come from him. Who are you? I am Malakul Maut, Ya Sulaiman. Your time is up. He says, why didn't you tell me earlier? Why didn't you send me a notice? Send me a text message? or some email, or something, you know, send me something here, tell me about it. I, I'm not expecting you now. The Malak al looks at him, he says, Sulaiman, where is your father Dawood? He said, he's dead. Where is your son? Sulaiman had a son who died. One of his sons died. He said, he's dead. He says, Sulaiman, so I've sent you many messages in the past. I've given you a lot of messages. But you chose to ignore. You know how you have the ignore button on the emails or the delete button? That's what you've been choosing to do. Now it's your turn, my friend. That's it. Time is up. And this king, this prophet of Allah, of course, this is a prophet of God who is ready to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But what about you and I? Are we there? Are we ready? It's all these things that we have to think about. So, if we start reading these du'as, they remind us that we vent, we remember that there is a God out there. And that's why religious people are happier. Religious people feel calmer. The more connected they are to Allah, the happier, the calmer they are. The materialistic aspect of things does not study this. They try. This contemporary world is trying by studying, for example, the psychology of the human being. That's why you have a name like Sigmund Freud. So popular. So Freud comes 
and does a psychoanalysis of the human being. Tries to figure out what drives the human being to do whatever he does. Now mind you, Freud studied patients. People who had some sort of, let's say, issues. So he tried to analyze their status. And so he came up with a theory of desire. The desire is the driving factor. Whatever the human being does is driven by his desires. And you have an entire school of thought built on this concept. That the human being is driven by his desire. Then he kind of modified it a little bit by introducing the whole ideas and the concepts of the id, the ego, or the superego, and so on and so forth. So he tried to kind of balance things out. And I don't want to bore you with all this talk. But he came to introduce all this. And people were wanting to listen to all this because they lacked the spirituality aspect. They could not explain the spirituality aspect. And this was the era or the time when people are saying, we don't need Allah. In fact, Freud himself says, we can use now religion, uh, we can use science to justify everything. Religion is something that Freud says, according to him, religion is something that was needed in the past. People back when they were naive, they couldn't explain things. And they see something and they say, oh, well, that's religion because the, the act of God. That's when they need that's when they need a religion. Today we can explain things. Science can tell us everything. That's quite a faulty assumption. I mentioned yesterday in the Arabic lecture, many scientists are questioning the entire concept of coincidence or evolution, pure evolution. Many scientists are writing books about this whole issue. They question. And I mentioned last night in the Arabic lecture, there are a group of scientists who have come up with what they call the intelligent design theory. And they introduce some laws. One of them, is, the guy who's spearheading the whole thing is Michael Behe, who's a professor of biochemistry at Lehigh University in the States, which is one of the top ten universities in the States. He's a professor of biochemistry. He studied the machinery of the bacteria. The bacteria is a single cell organism. So he studies the machinery. And he says, it's no coincidence that they have all these machineries and organelles all acting up together. This can't happen. There must be a designer for all this. So they came up with the intelligent design theory. Another mathematician used the probability theory. If you have, let's say, for example, let's say, I'm going to change the theory a little bit. But suppose you have ten pebbles. You put them in a bag, you number them from 1 to 10, 10 pebbles, 1 to 10, you put them in a bag, then you would draw one, or let's say you throw them all on the ground, well, pebble one will fall in one place, pebble two in another place, pebble three and so on, let's say you mark them, you collect them all, put them in the bag, throw them a second time, what is the probability? that each one of those pebbles will fall right in the exact same position again. Ten. You think so? One out of hundred? No, my friend. It's exponential. It's, it's gigantic. The term, I, I don't even know how much because it's so big of a value. The fraction is almost impossible. So, he proved that coincidence cannot be the reason. It's impossible. By using probability, by using some logic, it's not possible. So, when you have scientists themselves saying that this is not the case. I had a friend of mine, he was uh, studying at the University of Toronto in Canada. And uh, he took an elective on astronomy an elective course. He says, one day my teacher was teaching in the classroom and he was saying, you know, like, you know, the stars are like this way and here's the orbit of the sun, the orbit of the moon, and he was talking about all these different orbits and things. And then he says, my teacher paused for a second. And he looked at us and he says, it's difficult to imagine all this happened by coincidence. And then he continued. 
the discussion. So here is an astronomer, a person who's talking, now subhanAllah, لَالشَّمْسُ يَنْبَغِي لَهَا أَن تُدْرِكَ الْقَمَرَ وَلَا اللَّيْلُ سَابِقُ النَّهَارُ وَكُلٌّ فِي فَلَكٍ يَسْبَحُونَ You'll never have a case where the orbit of the sun will cross path with the orbit of the moon. Each one has its own orbits. And you'll never have a case where the sun says, you know what, I'm tired, I need a vacation. You know, every day for the past, I don't know how many billions of years I've been rising and setting, rising, I need a break. No. Or the moon says, you know what, I like earth, I want to come a bit too close to earth. No. I want to come closer. It's never the case. Yes, maybe it comes, but within a radius. You know, back on June 23rd, this year, June 23rd, there was what's, what's, what's called a supermoon. Supermoon, the moon came a bit too close to Earth. Well, I mean, not too close, closer. It was about 5,000 miles closer than its normal distance, approximately. And it just so happened, now, I believe there's a wisdom in everything. In fact, in Islamic philosophy, we say there's no coincidence. There's no such thing as a coincidence in Islamic philosophy. That same night was actually the, the eve of the 15th night of Sha'ban. That same night, the 23rd of June, was the eve of the 15th night of Sha'ban. Maybe there's a link. Anyways, so, but it does not cross beyond this. I mean, within the usual, let's say. So there is this perfect organization, and that's what's made scientists, a lot of them, think and discuss that, you know what? We don't agree with Freud. That religion is something of the past. No, I'm sorry, I don't believe in that. And here I am, I'm a scientist myself. You know, I remember, you know, it, it took me sometimes to synthesize some crystals in the laboratory. And I had to really watch the oxygen. I had to deoxygenate the whole atmosphere. No oxygen should be there, otherwise the reaction would fail. I had to make sure that the ratios of the elements or the chemicals I use is right, otherwise I won't get the desired product. I had to watch the temperature of the reaction. I had to watch the time of the reaction. I had to do all these things to make sure I get the nice end product. If it was just a mere coincidence, it would be great. I leave all the chemicals there in the fume hood. I'll say, I'll see you in one month, inshallah. Ma salama. You guys finish everything, I'll come back. No. I would have finished my PhD in one year, or in one month. Leave it all. Just do it all. But it doesn't work that way. With one simple reaction, it requires so much effort and design and organization so that I can get the desired product. So, scientists are not agreeing with this concept that we don't need religion. On the contrary, there is a desire. And this designer gave us laws. These laws cater to the physical aspect of the human being and to the spiritual aspect of the human being. Harun al-Bashid had a very intelligent Christian doctor by the name of Bakhtashiur. Bakhtashiur one day was talking with one of the judges in the court of Harun. Ali ibn Hussein al -Wabit. He told him that your religion is great. Your Quran is fine. But really, your Quran only addresses the spiritual aspects of the human being. It does not address the physical aspects of the human being. And we know knowledge is of two types. The knowledge of the body, the physical aspects, and the knowledge of religion, which is the spiritual aspects. So he's classifying knowledge into two categories. Knowledge that kind of relates to the physical aspect, and knowledge that relates to the spiritual aspect. That's how this man is classifying them. So he says, you, Quran, addresses only the spiritual aspects, not the physical aspects. And this is one of the many accusations that people give to Islam, by the way. Today, you have different kind of accusations against Islam. That Islam, for example, suppresses freedom. That Islam, for example, does not give women their rights. And, and, and all these kind of accusations against Islam. So it's important for us to learn about the religion of Islam 
so that we can address these misconceptions. This man, this judge, Ali ibn Hussein, was actually quite smart. He told him, in the contrary, our Quran addresses all the concepts of medicine in half an ayah, half a verse. He says, really? He says, yes. And our holy prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, addresses medicine, the remaining aspects of medicine, also in one hadith. He says, where? He says, as for the Quran, Allah says, Kulu wa wala tusrifu. Eat and drink, but in moderation. In moderation. He says that's the essence of medicine. In fact, today, a lot of doctors are telling you, watch your diet. Diet and exercise. I remember I worked with a professor once who said, you can eat anything you want. And this is my news to you guys, you know. Congratulations. Month of Ramadan, the whole table, all that great stuff, mashallah, all these baklawas. You know? Enjoy. Like they say, knock yourself dead. Uh, no, sorry, I'm just the part. But, you can, yeah, the butt part, yeah. You can eat anything you want, as long as you work it out. You work it out. So if you exercise it, you balance it with exercise and your care. You remember there is that uh, gold medalist swimmer, the American Phelps, Michael Phelps? You no, know, he kind of has a world record in gold medalist. <laughs> Nonetheless, this guy, I remember, there was an article once in the newspaper, a gigantic article, said this guy could, be, could eat all the burgers he wants and the fries, as much as he wants, because he burns every day something like 11,000 calories. Every day. He's burning about 11,000 in practice, as he's practicing, 11,000 calories. So he could eat anything he wants, this guy. So as long as you burn it, you can eat it, my friend. No problem. So in moderation, and that's exactly what the Quran says. You know, they say there was this guy. I don't know how many of you speak Farsi here, but uh, it's, it's a Farsi story. There was this guy who was at a at dinner, you know, like the one we have, mashallah, here, where the table was like beautiful and great and all these foods and whatever. So this guy would take a bite and would drink afterwards, and take a bite and then another drink, a bite and a drink. Someone told him, "Man, you're gonna kill yourself." Take it easy. He said, I'm doing what the Quran is telling me to do. <laughs> Where? He says, Quran says, Kulu wa <laughs> He said, my friend, continue with the ayah. He says, no, 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 no. That's enough for us. <laughs> the remaining part is bad for business. No, we just take this. And we're laughing about it, but unfortunately many of us do the same thing. You know, we tell our sisters, wear your hijab, they say, no, hijab is not in the Quran. So that's okay. You know, that's, that's bad for business. Salat, yes, I'll do my salat, no problem. That's, that's okay. It's easy. Fasting, yeah, yeah, I'll do that. Or you tell the brothers, you have to pay khums. No, no, khums is not in the Quran. Khums was at the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa I remember a man sitting down with, with, with a scholar. He's telling him khums was from the time of Rasulullah. Today we don't have khums. He says, huh? Where did you come with that from? He says, because Allah says, when he talks about khums, he, he uses the word ghanimtum, ghanima. Whatever you kind of, I guess ghanima could be used as war booty. And therefore, this is only at the time of wars. Today we don't have any wars. And hence, we don't have khums. That's his conclusion. Very genius guy. And unfortunately, these days we have a lot of such geniuses, alhamdulillah, mashallah. <laughs> so, this alim says, okay, well, this ayah that you're talking about is in Surah Al-Anfal. Surah Al-Anfal has this ayah. He says, in the same surah, in fact, in the same surah, Allah says, وَكُلُوا مِمَّا غَنِمْتُمْ حَلَالًا طَيِّبًا And eat from what, basically, again, the word غَنِمْتُمْ. Okay. Eat. He said, how do you define this word غَنِمْتُمْ here? What, what's your definition of غَنِمْتُمْ in this one, in this ayah? He says, this one means whatever you gain. He's like, ah, interesting. So in the first part, you define the word غَنِمْتُمْ as war booty. Because that worked well with business. But in the latter part, you define it as gain. Well, why did you change the definition all of a sudden, my friend? It's the same word. It's like, hmm, okay, didn't say a word after that. So sometimes when we try to come up with excuses, we can find some excuses, but they're lay excuses, with all due respect. They don't stand 
And that's where we need the fuqaha, the scholars, to come and educate us about religion. We cannot just really elevate by reading the Qur'an. I know a lot of people speak Arabic. Well, just because you speak Arabic doesn't mean you can understand the Qur'an. The Qur'an itself says, فَاسْأَلُوا أَهْلَ الذِّكْرِ Ask the people of the Qur'an. The Qur'an itself says that you have to go to those who know how to interpret the Qur'an for you. The Prophet ﷺ says, مَنْ فَسَّرَ الْقُرْآنَ بِرَأْيَهِ فَلْيَتَبَوَّأْ مَقْعَدَهُ مِنَ النَّارِ Anyone who interprets the Qur'an based on his own understanding, he should be aware that his place is reserved in Jahannam, wal billah. We have to go back to Ahl al-Bayt. Yes, reading the Qur'an to learn from it, no problem. Reading the Qur'an to reflect upon it, of course, that's good, do so. So read the ayat of the Qur'an that talks, for example, about punishment, about Jahannam, the ones that talk about Jannah, paradise, the one that talks to the human being, addresses his mind, is, sure, we want to learn. Allah says, don't they reflect? We reflect. And Allah says, He did not say, There is difference between tadabbur and tafsir. Or ta'weel. Allah doesn't say that you should go ahead and interpret it yourself. For interpretation, you go back to the sources. And that is Ahlul Bayt Nonetheless, this individual says, well, that's what the Quran says, eat and drink. So there is an Iranian poet, now his name is Mawlana Jalaluddin. He says when it comes to eating and drinking, he listens quite tentatively. But when it comes to do not extravagate, he forgets about that. You know? So it's quite interesting here how sometimes we follow the Quran. But going back to Bakhtashur, that doctor, so he says, this is basically half of medicine here. Watch what you eat. And watch what you drink, and you'll be all right. He says, and our holy prophet says that the source of most diseases is the stomach. And do not give your stomach the food which is not used to having. I don't know how many of you guys here have had Indian food. It's too heavy. Indian food, mashallah. It's too Those of us who are not used to it. I mean, it's very tasty food. I have nothing against it. You know, it's great food. It's very tasty. It smells so great. But you eat it in the month of Ramadan. Those of you who are not used to eating it. Okay. And you might be calling the basically fire truck. <laughs> Afterwards because it's just so spicy, we're not used to it. And it may cause ulcers, so it may cause some issues with your complications. Because we're not used to them. Now to them, it's quite, they're used to it, they've grown up with it. So to them, they're kind of accustomed to this kind of food. We're not used to that kind of food, but there's nothing wrong with it. Like I said, it's very tasty food, it's just, the Prophet says, don't give yourself something that you're not used to having on a regular basis. So then this, Doctor Bakhtashur, because he was silent, he had no, no, nothing to say. He said, you know, your prophet and your Quran did not leave anything out for Galen. Galen was a, a Greek doctor, very well known. In Arabic they call him Jalinos. He said, you know, you, you address everything, all aspects of medicine. So, so these are some of the things. Quran addresses the physical aspect of the human being. And the ahadith also address the physical aspect. The sharia. Ah. The laws of Allah, whereas they also address the laws of the spirituality, the spiritual aspects of things. When Allah tells us pray five times a day, He's addressing our spirituality. We need it. And those who don't do it realize there's something wrong. Because the laws of Allah actually go in line with the natural state of the human being. What's known as fitrah. They go hand in hand. The laws of Allah are with the fitrah. That's why religion is really something that is kind of spontaneous for those who follow it. Allah says, يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ بِكُمُ الْيُسْرُ وَلَا يُرِيدُ بِكُمُ الْعُسْرُ Allah wants to make your life easy, not difficult. So even fasting, when we say, let's say you have to fast for 12 hours or 20 hours, which may seem a little bit difficult, but rather, in the long term, it's actually a benefit for you. Praying, it's a benefit for you. Staying away from the haram, it's a benefit for you. 
And that's why you find anyone who does anything haram, anything, small or big, he or she always feels guilty. And the human nature knows this is wrong. He knows it's wrong. I mentioned a couple of days ago about drinking. Even though it's allowed from the legal perspective in many countries, it's allowed. But look at how many people die from drinking and driving. In Canada alone, about four people die every day, every day from drinking driving related accidents. And we're not talking about the injuries, we're not talking about the insurance claims, the financial losses, those who are hospitalized and the government ends up paying for their hospitalization and this money comes from your pocket and my pocket as taxpayers. So in the long term, the whole society is losing. Why? Because some companies are making billions of dollars. It does not make much sense. A human being, when he doesn't follow the laws of Allah, there's something wrong. In, where in Canada, the city where I come from, the province, it's an oil province, there's a lot of oil. It's what's called the oil sand. So that oil is a bit kind of, requires some more process to be purified. And hence, the environmentalists are crying because it's affecting the environment. But who's listening? Nobody. Because who's digging this oil? We're talking about giant corporations. Multi-trillion dollar corporations. So who's going to listen to some environmentalists? Who cares if we destroy the environment? Big deal. Do you remember that um, Gulf of Mexico? The well that shattered and that tons of oil that was basically sent into the Gulf and affected not too ago, this was about maybe three years ago? Do you hear anything about it anyways, any these days? It's good because actually in the news in North America, nothing. Unless you dig into it. If you dig, then you'll find. But otherwise, nothing in the news. How did that impact the environment? How did it impact the world? Nothing. The human being's greed is pushing all this. That's why we go back to the Parnain. The Parnain says those who are corrupt, we're going to hold them accountable and we have to punish them. Because they are ruining it for everybody and they need to be held accountable. And then we'll punish them now, but then the ultimate punishment is in the hereafter. And we'll talk more about that, inshallah, in the next time. So this summarizes the first trip of Dhul Qarnayn that he made to the West. And there's still a lot more to discuss here about Dhul Qarnayn. What other trips did Dhul Qarnayn do? Where else did he go? What else did he encounter? We'll discover that, inshallah, in the next episode of the series of Adventures of Dhul Qarnayn, inshallah. So join us for that, inshallah. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless us to be among the sincere followers of Ahlul Bayti alayhi wa salam. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide us the straight path, the path of Muhammad, wa Ali Muhammad, may Allah grant us their shafa'ah in this world, in the qabr and in the hereafter. Ila huwa hilmameena wal mu'minat, rahimallah man yakhra al-fatiha ma'as-salawat. Allah, 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 All